Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yanni Herat, for your uh, forward-looking perspective. Please join me in thanking uh, him. Uh, the first of time, let us move forward. The second speaker for this, this session is Professor um, Teshono Abel. Now, he is currently Professor of Economics and Professor Laureate at Eastern Illinois University, where he is also serving on the faculty of science. His great experience includes the following. Department Chair, Dean, later as Associate Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at Colorado uh, State University in Florida. Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Food Security Unit in Michigan. And Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Eastern Illinois University. He is he has so published three books, a number of articles, numerous essays, both in Ethiopian and Africa. For the interest of time, I call upon <coughs> Professor Toshona to make his speech. discussing death. Nagel and uh, Das Gupta have a more elegant discussion of this, but there are these three circumstances of death we should distinguish. There is death that comes naturally to one in the fullness of time. There is death that comes not from one's, uh, from one's hands before one's time. And there is death that is brought on one by one's own deliberate action. Regardless of your population ethics, I know you join me in condemning, not just praying for them, but condemning the deaths of the second kind, wherever it's occurring in our country. I intend to argue in my speech that there are predictable forces My speech that there are predictable forces that drive the future of our society and indeed the future of all societies. The Bisomoyo articulated these forces and they include changing demographics with all its consequences, inequality in income, education and opportunities, scarcity of commodities including scarcity of capital, technological innovation, the development and deployment of technologies, and what it means for society and the economy. In the past, Ethiopia's path to development has envisaged agriculture as the basis of economic growth. That was a political necessity, and were it to be realized, a stimulus for economic development in our country. But because we as a nation have been unable to revolutionize agricultural output and because we have squandered roughly 50 years without adding or adding to or protecting the inherent productive value of the land, it is time to organize ourselves differently than we have attempted to do so in the past. Farming until you cannot bear it anymore has had a dark side and harmful effects on agricultural communities. We need to intentionally include cities as the basis for economic growth and macroeconomic policy making. Uh, one way of organizing our society is by building mini megalopolis, a sort of roughly adjacent city agglomerations forming a continuous urban region. 
This approach should add to the growth of the country's GDP, use agglomerations as an engine of the country's economy, and by implication, reimagine the impact and deploy the insight into how infrastructure plans and economic development policy should be directed to initiate or improve regional integration in Ethiopia. In addition, it will be argued that cities are dynamic centers of exchange, innovation, and economic growth, and provide the platform where people, ideas, and capital come together. As a consequence, regulations and political schemes that limit urban development constrain the movement of labor and capital, reduce the potential for income mobility, and rising standard of living over time. Because this is a speech on a futuristic impression of Ethiopia in 2050, I don't intend to suggest a hypothesis or test one. I merely wish to imagine with you an Ethiopia 30 years from now. As a consequence, I am ready to accept all accusations, allegations, anger, or whatever it is that you might cast in my direction, but I am determined to succeed. Please imagine Ladies and gentlemen, imagine that healthy communities matter because they are essential for sustaining vibrant market democracies. Once we understand that, then it is not simply enough for a country to experience a strong economic growth. It is it, it, how it is distributed becomes very important. As might be expected, people who love, love their community wish to stay in that community, but expect growth to benefit them as well. If we care about the community, we need to care about the geographic distribution of growth. Imagine further, consistent with some theory, that we have the following conditions. Flat featureless plain, even distribution of rural population, and even distribution of purchasing power, no transportation infrastructure, at least at first, and nothing that affects transportation costs except, of course, distance, and that economic agents are economically rational, and that is consumers minimize costs, frequently shop at closest opportunities, and that retailers maximize profits or maximize trade areas. Imagine as well that federalism as a conflict-reducing device has enabled the country to prevent violence among different groups, within the country. That Francis Fukuyama's three important pillars of democracy, namely a strong government, the rule of law, and democratic accountability are present. Please also imagine that we have free markets, cherish and enforce private property rights. Furthermore, please imagine that the government of the day is focused on building prosperity with a few critical objectives namely to create jobs, to provide basic services efficiently, and run a clean government a la Paul Collier. With this in mind, I dare suggest to you that we can offer diagnosis and even contingent predictions to suggest the way forward for our country. With the goal of enhancing the richness of our conversation, I will in the following paragraph cite as evidence key economic variables of the Ethiopian economy. That would be followed by an argument of what must be done so as to avoid economic stagnation and decline to mitigate, at least in some way, the social, political, and economic problems that failure would and entail. The globalization has been good to many countries. And it has also changed our understanding of the rest of the world. <laughs> Some countries have benefited more from globalization than others have. And as Ian Bremer notes, the future of globalization is not very clear at the moment. China, who practices state capitalism, relies heavily on state-owned enterprises, and its objectives are to ensure economic and political stability in its own country. In the West, and elsewhere, new technologies are making production more efficient and are lowering costs of production. As Ian Bremer's insight suggests, 
The marketplace for commodities, the export of most developing countries, including Ethiopia, is, be is becoming more globalized, meaning more competition. The market for goods and services, on the other hand, will become less global. This has to do with the fact that the share of labor in its production is declining rapidly because of technology and automation. What does this mean? It means that the search for cheap labor to produce goods and services is declining as the rise of middle class in at least some of these countries has increased wages. This provides producers incentives to further automize production and produce where the consumers are. Furthermore, one byproduct of globalism is anger in some countries at the prospect of job losses. This in turn has given rise to politicians who are calling for higher tariffs and enact policies to restrict trade. At the center of all of this is the crucial factor for the movement of capital. As everyone here realizes, the holders of capital assets enjoy certain privileges. Katharina Piskor calls these privileges A, the privilege of priority, B, the privilege of durability, and C, the privilege of convertibility, which means, or which enables past gains to be locked in, and D, the privilege of universality, which ensures that all the other privileges are uh, retained globally. The implication of this is crucial. Those countries that are unstable, chaotic, mired in corruption and non-governance, and pertaining these four privileges are unlikely to attract capital. Closer to home, we have a population growth rate of 2.31% at the present, an eye-popping doubling of the population in just 30 years, 2050. Yeah, using the simplest calculations here. An urban population of 20.3% and an urban working age population of 12.8 million people compared to the working population of 40.8 million persons. In my opinion, Ethiopia is a microcosm of world-facing population explosion as the United Nations itself has forecast that the glo global population would exceed 9.7 billion people in 2050. The continent of Africa will be home for over 40% of the world's population by the end of the century. <laughs> Making matters worse, enormous gaps remain between what is the state of development and what the re reality is at home. In terms of revenue generated in last land use fees, a highly neglected variable in Ethiopia, the following data is instructive. Rural land use fees generated 334, 37, 410 million for 2015, 2016, and 2017. While urban land use fee generate, generated 1.2 billion, 2.5 billion, and 2.6 billion uh, dollars for the same period. The performance rate of rural land use is 93.8%, and for urban land use, it's 105.9%. This is a classic example of the consequences of developing land at different levels. When it comes to mobile technology, the country has about 58 million sub users for 2016 uh, 2017, and total data and internet use stands at about 16 million, as is reported by the National Bank. This is indicative of the state of development, diffusion of, and de deployment of technology in our country and what that means for society and the economy. Finally, when we look at the number of total investment projects and the amount of capital, the, the picture emerged that in the main, only three regions, Tigray, Amara, Ormea, and only one city, Addis Ababa, are the main beneficiaries, as the data indicates. This, in my view, is evidence that despite the highly publicized investment boom in the country, the number and size of those investments have not panned out as desired. When we look at the structure of cities in Ethiopia, 
UNESCO provides useful data on the population size uh, of cities in Ethiopia, and uh, size of the towns and cities. The country has just one city over a million people, th three cities with population between 200 and 300,000, and so on and so forth, because I am being told to move on. Finally, the data also attests to the fact that Ethiopia and the United States have one number in common, and that number is 81. 81% of Ethiopia's population resides in rural areas, while 81% of the U.S. population resides in urban areas. <laughs> These rural populations are what Anne-Marie Slaughter calls the invisible people, locked out of formal economy, and for the most part, unable to vote, travel, or access medical and edu educational benefits. It is not that they are undeserving and unqualified, it is that they are also data poor. So what should we do? Allow me to offer a modest proposal. As everyone here recognizes, the main source of private sector independence in developed countries and thus also property rights protection is the private sector's productive efficiency that comes only through constant competition. But there is also a second source, and it is numbers. When few entities dominate the private sector, it is easy for them to get into an arrangement with the government. But when the number of firms is very large, their interests diverge and sometimes oppose. This is the lesson that emerged when we considered the data on the number of cities and perhaps the concentrated production as well as power that seems to have been vested in just a few cities in Ethiopia. What would ensue if we were to develop many large cities, many megalopolis as I would call them, in the form of a set of roughly adjacent city agglomerations forming a continuous urban region? For example, what would happen if we were to form an agglomeration between Addis Ababa and Nazareth? As you can see, Jima and Awasa, Baghdad and Gondar, and I'll be very quick here, <clears throat> Jima and Soto, Dreda and Harar and Jigjiga, how about between Arbamint and Yirgalem and Awasa, Magale and Aligrat, and Doba and Guinea, <laughs> Nekamse and Gimbi, Desse Kombolcha and Waldia. Okay? The smaller circles are the current population, the larger blue colors are the um, doubling of population by 2050 in these uh, cities and towns. Addis, with its nearly 3 million people, and Nazareth, with its nearly 214 million residents, would be an ideal agglomeration, and it may be happening right at the moment. The largest city in the country, and the fourth largest city with Bishoftu in between them, would be an ideal agglomeration of a city. So, why this agglomeration? Let me give a few reasons, and I will cut my comments short. Why am I suggesting this as an intentional growth plan by policymakers? The answer is because this is the real world. And in the real world, we need an economics that can integrate resources, social mobility, and the environment into a cohesive, realistic, internally driven, long-term framework. The UN says by 2050, 60 percent of the world population will live in urban areas. As I stated earlier, 81% of the population in, in, in uh, Ethiopia lives in rural areas. Worldwide, agglomerations produce 30 trillion in GDP, roughly 35% of the world's output, according to Euromonitor International. According to Euromonitor International, in a very robust study, 20 megalopolis have been identified, 9 in North America, 7 in Asia, 3 in Europe, and 1 in Latin America. These accounted for 35% of global 